at why Christians are taken up with this book called the Bible? Why they read it so much? Why they talk about it so much? Why it's the whole subject of their life? For this reason, they do not live by bread alone. So they're very taken up with the word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The second one we looked at was tested and tempted. And we've seen in James that God does not tempt any man, but he tests us. And we're going to continue to see that in our worship. He tests who you worship. So don't be surprised if God today and throughout every day of your life will test your worship. What you're worshiping and who you're serving. However, the temptation to Jesus was to be presumptuous with God. To test God. God tests us. Satan loves to take those tests, what are meant to purify us, and make it a temptation. And thereby lead us astray away from God into sin. And God, in that temptation that we experience through Satan, God comes to us as he did to Cain. And that was the, the title of the, or the subject the, that we looked at last time that I spoke was, the way of Jesus or the way of Cain, how it warns us in the book of Jude. Cain was tempted, first of all, tested by God when God wouldn't, wasn't pleased with his sacrifice and he wouldn't accept it. And then God showed up to Cain and he said, sin is crouching at your door. Don't yield to it. Overcome it. But Cain yielded to his passions of jealousy, pride, and it overcame him. He did not listen to God's word, nor live by it. He lived according to his flesh. And of that flesh, he reaped corruption called sin. And the Bible warns you and I of those two ways to live. One is the way that Jesus overcame this temptation to test God or be presumptuous with his life. Or to yield to that and blame God. And you'll notice that with Cain. He, the, 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 the last attitude that we can read that he had towards God was he blamed God even for his discipline, his punishment that he received for his sin. So today we want to look in Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. Again, the devil took him, Jesus, to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these will I give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Why do you think that this temptation was tempting to Jesus? Did the devil have the right to give Jesus all the kingdoms of the world? Yes, he did. At this point, he was the prince of the power of the air, and he still is. And God has given the world over to him for the season. In fact, it will be his until the very last battle where the Lord establishes righteousness on the earth. The old earth passes away and a new earth comes in. And only Jesus Christ reigns as the King of kings and Lord of lords. This particular temptation hit at the very heart and purpose of why Jesus came to the earth in the first place. Jesus came as a baby, not as a king, but as a baby to grow up into a man to overcome the devil in this very area through the power of the cross. And what Satan was offering him was there's another way that you can become king. You don't need to become, go through the cross and deal with all this suffering and the ridicule and the hardness of this ministry, this life that your father in heaven gave you. There's another way. Just fall down and worship me and I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. 
You'll still be king. But Satan was partially lying to him because he knew that if Jesus would worship him, he would also serve him. And I want to show that to you in scripture, that whom you worship is whom you serve. Whom we serve is the indicator of who we really worship. The two are one. Worship is defined in the old English language as a devoted love which will sacrifice itself. A devoted sacrificial love. That's what he was asking from Jesus. And Jesus knew it. It was a devoted sacrificial love. He was hitting at the very heart of Jesus' love. Who do you love? Will you love me? Or will you love your father? And that's still the heart of worship in every one of us. We get to experience this temptation. We get to be tested in this area, every one of us, every day. It's a principle of life that Jesus overcame. Just like we get to be tested when you live by bread alone or by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God every day. We get to be tested by this principle of presumptuous testing God every day. Will you be careless with your faith? Will you do things presuming that his grace will save you? That test is before us every day. And people who take it lightly and presume on God's grace, they quickly, loosely sin, <coughs> yielding to sin, presuming God will forgive me, yielding to sin, presuming God's grace will cover me. He'll redeem me again. Just like he tested Jesus, tempted Jesus saying, jump off the pinnacle of the temple. His angels will keep charge over you. The word of God says. And the only way we overcome that is by saying, on the other hand, the word of God also says. And so we overcome him by the word of God, even when he uses the word of God against us. Let me grab a marker. That one's not going to work. So we're looking at worship and what it is in our life. And this really convicted me and challenged me in my life as I looked at this in a fresh way. The first time that we find the word worship in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 21. Turn your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 21. Here Abraham becomes the first man to be, that is recorded in the word of God, to be tested on who he really worshipped. And you can read this temptation or this testing, which could have led Abraham into a very different life. In chapter, in, uh, in chapter 21, in verse 9, actually, we'll back up a little bit. Notice that, you know, Abraham now is 100 years old. He had obeyed God. He had left his family and came out in this land of Canaan all by himself. He was just a small, and as Psalm says, there were very few in it. The people of his family were not a big family. And then God blessed him for that, and his family and his servants, and he began to accumulate a lot of wealth. But what he really desired was an inheritance, because that was the promise the Lord had given him. The promise was that he would have children and a large family. And Abraham wanted to go about this way in a very physical way. And so through Hagar, Ishmael was born. And Abraham was attached to Ishmael, even though God had told him, he's not really the one. There's going to be another one. And then sure enough, at the age of 100 and Sarah almost being 100 years old, they had a son. His name was Isaac. Now I want you to notice 
that in verse 9, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid should not be heir with my son Isaac. And the matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son. He had affections for this son whom he had through Hagar, this son of Ishmael. It was his first son, his first child. Even though it wasn't the child of promise, he was close to him. It was his first son, first child. But the Lord told him, verse 12, but God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her, for through Isaac your descendants shall be named. So Abraham put him out. Pack, packed her up, gave her a, uh, sufficient supplies to go for a while. And you can read the rest of the story, how God said, out of him will also come a great nation. So Abraham, I'm going to focus in on him. He was distressed. He went through this separating. He lost his firstborn son. And he left, packed him up and left. And then God comes to him right after, right in the middle of that pain. And he says to him, hey, Abraham, Verse chapter 22, verse 1. Now it came about after things that God tested Abraham. You hear you find the word God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I tell you. Wait, what, God? You just got done telling me I need to obey my wife because she was jealous and send out my firstborn son. Now, you make, now you're telling me I got to get rid of my, the son of promise? God, what about the promise that you gave me that I'm going to have, my, my descendants will be as the stars of the sky and as the sand by the seashore? What about your promise, God? Are you, are you kidding me? Do you understand the severity of this test? How it must have struck Abraham deep in his heart. He was deeply distressed over sending Ishmael out. How much more so with the son of promise that he was supposed to kill now? So Abraham rose early in the morning. Doesn't tell us much about what went on in Abraham's heart. But what it does tell us was what he did. And that really spoke to me. Worship is not, it is an attitude of the heart, but it is more an act of obedience of whom you serve than it is the feelings that you may have. I believe Abraham was very, very distressed, is the word used. If he was so with Ishmael, sending out Ishmael, how much more now? And here he was in a place where it looked like God was calling him to get rid of both of his sons. Directly against the promise that God had given him. But Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering. And he arose and he went to the place which God told him. And God made sure it wasn't just an overnight decision. He wanted this thing to really Get into Abraham's heart. Abraham, it will be a three-day test. A three days long journey. And you're going to walk through this for three days in the battle of your heart. Will you continue to trust me for three days? Will you continue to take this journey and overcome all of the, that distress and those emotions and those feelings and the battles of your thoughts and your mind Will you continue to just go and obey? And on the third day, verse 4, Abraham raised his eyes and he saw the place from a distance. Can you imagine the foreboding feelings that Abraham must have been having at this point? And yet, Abraham's faith overcame all of those. And we'll see why. What he believed that caused him to obey God without delay. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go yonder and we will worship and return to you. Do you find the faith there? 
and we will worship and we will return to you. He didn't say, I will worship and return. He said, we will. And I want to show you what the Holy Spirit says that Abraham believed in Hebrews chapter 11. This is where his faith was. And this is where his worship was. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Wait, did he actually kill him? In his heart, it was already done. He offered him up. He worshipped. He offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. God had just told him that before he told him to go kill him. He considered, Abraham considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead. Now that had never happened. Abel was killed and he didn't raise up from the dead when Cain killed Abel. No one had ever been raised from the dead that Abraham ever had heard of or knew of. But his faith believed that God was going to, through Isaac, give him a family because God had promised it. And now that God was asking him to kill him, he said, okay, God, I don't believe you're going to spare this. I'm going to kill him, but you're going to raise him from the dead. That's where his faith was, that God would raise him from the dead. He considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. You see what happened in Abraham's heart? He actually received him back. That means he had given him. He had killed him. He had offered him up in his heart. He had worshipped. Verse 6, And Abraham of Genesis 22, And Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering, and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Now, many scholars believe that Isaac was about 12 years old at this point. He understood what was going on. He was old enough and strong enough to carry the wood on his back. Isaac, a 12-year-old boy. It wasn't like he was an infant. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, you have the fire. You have the matches. I have the wood. Behold the fire and the wood. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Can you imagine what must have went through Abraham's heart? How shall I answer my son? Tell him he's the lamb. This 12-year-old boy did nothing wrong. I'm going to kill him. And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two walked on together. Abraham believed that God would provide an other offering. He would provide the lamb. That's what he said. God will provide for himself the lamb. Not the son, the lamb. So then they came to the place which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there, arranged the wood, and then he bound up his son. He tied him up. And he laid him on the altar of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and he took the knife. To kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Now it's so interesting that Abraham heard that voice and stopped. His faith had not been that, Abra that Isaac would be saved. No, God said, kill him. Did God not mean what he said? God said, go kill him. And in the midst of him, his obedience to God. His faith was that God would resurrect him. 
He was going to see God raise somebody from the dead. Maybe there was a, a, a twinge of excitement in his heart to see what God would do. But God changed it up right at a very critical moment, just before he killed him. And Abraham's sensitive ears heard that voice. And his obedient heart stopped him in his tracks. Yes, Lord. Do nothing to him. Do nothing to him. Okay, Lord. For now I know that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son, Isaac, from me. Had Abraham not been a man whose obedience had already been tested. His worship was already there to God and he served God through obedience. He would have killed Isaac. But his heart wasn't set on killing Isaac. His heart was set on worshiping his God. You see, so often you and I can get taken up with the act of sacrifice itself that God clearly commanded us to do, that our ears can become dull of hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit in the midst of the act of obedience, of sacrifice, God changes it up. And you and I may completely miss the very purpose that God had called us to that sacrifice for because our hearts we're set on the act of obedience, the act of sacrifice. And here's how the Lord showed it to me. You can come to me, Phil, with a heart to obey me. But if that heart of affection begins to shift on the act of obedience and begins to bring pride in your heart and say, Wow, Lord, you're calling me to do this amazing thing of sacrifice and look what I'm doing for you and your heart becomes centered on yourself and how well you're pleasing God. You'll miss the Holy Spirit's voice when he changes it up in the middle of it. And you may slay the sacrifice. It wasn't what God wanted. God did not want Isaac killed. He was testing Abraham's worship. Where, whom will you really worship? Whom will you really serve? Will you serve me and worship me alone? God is saying. So I want you to note that Abraham's faith was not on God's commandment or on God's promise. His faith was in God himself. And he was tuning his worship, his listening ears towards God because he believed God would provide a lamb some way. Either Isaac was going to be killed and God was going to raise him, but somehow God was going to provide a lamb. It wasn't going to be Isaac because Isaac was the son of promise. So what I'm drawing out from Abraham's life and what the Holy Spirit draws out from Abraham's example to you and I is that our worship should be towards God himself, never focused on our act of obedience to him, that means nothing. Whether God asks me whatever he asks me to do, I'll gladly just do it because he's my God and I'm here to serve him and to please him. This changes, it tests and it changes our whole attitude in how we worship and serve God. And this is what was coming at Jesus himself. This is the very test. Jesus was here testing Abraham. And now he was being tested with this very same test or temptation that Satan came to him with. So Abraham, verse 13, raised his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him, a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. 
So I also want you to notice something else. That worship is a sacrifice. Worship, the first time that the word worship in the Bible is used, it was in this sacrifice of something that was very close and dear to Abraham's heart because it was promised by God. So often, I have seen in my own life, worship as something that I just, of my own free will, give to God. And somehow, that should please God because I gave it up of my own free will. That's not where worship was found or in its context. It was an act of obedience commanded by God himself. And this is very crucial, dear brothers and sisters, because if your worship towards God and your service towards him is from your own ideas, from your own free will, you will receive some glory from it. You credit yourself with your own acts of worship. While you worship him, your heart will be praising yourself. But if it's a pure act of obedience, the Lord promising you something and then commanding you to go sacrifice that very promise he gave you, that is an act of worship, of sacrifice. I want to show you in Romans chapter 12 how this becomes personal to you and I today. In Romans chapter 12, he begins with this urging exhortation. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, what is, what your body is, you've been created by God and you have this body and now you find yourself here in this life, in this body and there's so many things that you can do for yourself in life. But Jesus comes along and you're, you hear his voice and he forgives your sins and he puts his spirit within you and the gospel that is preached many, many times is come to Jesus because he loves you and he wants to bless you and he wants to forgive your sins and your life will be full of his blessing. And that gospel is true. It's his promise all throughout the word. Come to me, all you that are laboring and are heavy laden. I will give you rest, Jesus said in Matthew 12. I'll give you rest. You'll find rest for your souls. I'll give you my, my love, my joy, my peace. I will bless your life with my grace, my divine heavenly influence. And the Holy Spirit comes and says, that promise I gave you, that I will do all this for you, I will put my spirit within you. Now give me that body. That body, give it to me as a sacrifice of worship and it'll be acceptable to me. It'll be a living and a holy sacrifice. And do not be conformed. Notice what the sacrifice is. Do not be conformed to the world. The world has a power to conform us, to pressure our lives, to make our lives look like they think it should look the ideal good life. There's an image in the world of what a good life looks like, what a good Christian life looks like. And the world is constantly doing everything it can to pressure your and I's life into that image. But we've been created in the image of God. And to, to live out that image, we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. That's what Abraham did. He proved what God's will was. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. This spiritual 
act of worship in our life becomes a continual living sacrifice. And there are three ways, three elements of our body or our person that the Lord looks at and he wants worship from. And he will test us just like he did Abraham in all three of these areas to see if we will have the faith that Abraham did to offer it up to him as a living sacrifice that is pleasing to him. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus spoke these words about the religious Jews. And he, he addressed their very act of worship in this. Now the Jews had put on a form. They had conformed what worship looks like. And it was quite different from the world. Because in John chapter 4, Jesus interacting with the woman there at the well in Samaria said to that woman, you guys don't know what you worship. Real worship is with the Jews in Jerusalem. But here, you guys don't even know what you worship. You, you come here to this mountain because Jacob's well was here and Jacob worshiped here. And, and, but Jesus made clear, no, the Jews know what they worship. So their, their worship was God-centered. It wasn't ancestry-centered like the Samaritans. It was God-centered, but it was something was missing and therefore it was empty. But in John 4, Jesus continued to say to that woman, God is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. What Jesus was saying is that if you worship God in your heart, that's true worship. So the Jews, though their center of their worship was God, the empty of their worship was their heart wasn't in it. They weren't worshiping from the inner man. They were worshiping with the outer man. And so Jesus looked at it and said, your worship is worthless. To God, it was absolutely zero. Worthless. Look at this in Mark chapter 7. Oh, I'm in John. That doesn't work. Mark chapter 7. Uh, we'll begin in verse 14. Actually, no, let's back up and begin. Um, we'll just begin in verse 1. And the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered together around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating with their bread, eating their bread with impure hands that is unwashed. They sat down at the table without washing their hands. Well, wow, that's pretty dirty, Right? especially if you were out in their elements. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. They first take a shower. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and all the copper pots. And the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And he said to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain, it's empty, it's worthless, but in Worthlessness do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God you hold to the tradition of men. Notice what was missing from their worship? The commandment of God. So they were doing things outwardly because men had conformed them into that form of worship. Dear brothers and sisters, we live in a Christianity that has many forms of worship. Created by men. And many, many can easily be conformed into that form of worship. But their heart isn't even in it. They come, their heart is not there as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice to their God. 
And God uses these things to test us. Where is your heart when you come to worship me? There are many commandments that are good commandments. But unless it is an act of obedience for you from God, it's empty worship. It may be your own idea. It may be your own, you know, uh, something that you have been taught from other men. I'll give you one illustration. And it was absolute emptiness for me. I remember years ago when the Holy Spirit first came into my life. And I was excited. I was filled with, it was like Abraham. God took me away from my family and the church I grew up with. And he put me out into a strange land, into a strange church, into strange people. And yet God had so filled my life with his Holy Spirit that I was giving my, my everything for his for him. And I was excited and I, I was, I gave up my job, my really good paying job, the promise of, you know, the next, uh, pretty much set for the rest of my life, my partnership in a business and was ready to move anywhere for God. And I did all of a sudden the Lord just called us to move out here to Colorado and uh, to a little struggling church of four families. And, and I, I remembered even the ministry there at the church in Pennsylvania told us, Katie and I, when we told him, we feel God calling us out here. You know, you'll probably be back here in a year. I don't, the church is not going to survive. We don't think so. There's a lot of problems in their homes. And I mean, they're coming together as just four families, but just, just be ready. You'll probably be back here in a year. But my heart was on fire for God. And through that time, I heard numerous men whom I really respected Preach a form of godliness. This, this excitement, this devoted love that you have, this is what you do. This is one of the things they said. Unless you at least spend two hours a day with God alone in the morning, your Christian life is worthless. So you must do that. It's the devoted love that gives your first part of the every day to Jesus. Don't give him your leftovers. Give him your all. Get up early in the morning and do it. In the middle of that, the Lord gave Katie and I a special needs son. And guess what he did? He didn't sleep all night. He was up many hours of the night. And as Katie and I began to carry that burden of being up with him, numerous hours of the night, that four o'clock to six o'clock in the morning thing kind of went out of my life. I just couldn't do it. It was wearing me out so bad. I was so tired. I remember going to work one morning after hardly sleeping that night. And I said to the Lord, Lord, I'm so tired. I'm going to die. That's how I felt. And the Lord said to me, who are you worshiping? Who are you serving? Men or me? Who told you you must have two hours, devoted hours every morning just to me? Where's your heart in it? Are you meeting with me? Or are you doing it because man put together a form? It may have been wonderful for that man. And it is indeed a wonderful experience. But my heart began to be fixated on the act of worship, on what I was doing for God, the sacrifice I was giving instead of to God himself. And it was killing me. My heart wasn't being blessed, wasn't being strengthened. My relationship with God was becoming more tired and more tired and wore out. It was becoming vain, empty, doing nothing for me except frustrating me. And then the Lord redirected my heart. And he said, Phil, I gave you this son. I gave you this experience. What I really want from you is to give your life as a living sacrifice, your body, and let me dictate as to what that looks like. Let me dictate the hours, the amount of time, the affections of your heart, where your thoughts are throughout the day. What your worship looks like is up to me, God said, not you. And it changed my life in a very big way. And the Lord released me, freed me from the tradition of man's worship to a life of worship 
and grace flooded my heart. And I began to just take the word of God with me throughout the day. Pray at the red lights. Just pray throughout the day. Have a heart. Engage my heart into this relationship with God throughout the day. In the little things, the big things. And all of a sudden, instead of having this devoted two-hour little quiet time, which contained my life of worship, I had 24 hours life of worship. And I read the words in Psalm. It is vain for you, old man, to rise up early and go to bed late. For why will you be robbed of your sleep? For God is able to give to his beloved even in his sleep. That word of God set me free to take the times when, I, when he gave it to me as sleep and the times when Christian got me up out of the night. The Lord said, sing to me. Read your word. And as I walked Christian throughout the, the house, I remember the Lord putting songs on my heart and we had a hymn book and I, I opened the hymn book and I, I would sing quietly to Christian this hymn book, these hymns out of, the, out of the hymn books. And it was amazing how it brought grace and peace to my own heart and stopped his crying and brought a rest to his soul. I would open the word and I'd, I'd, instead of sitting down or kneeling down, which was a spiritual thing to do in a dark closet somewhere with a little light and, you know, getting calluses on your knees and all of these things that were portrayed to me as the most spiritual thing to do. I just, while I was holding our son and comforting him, I began to just open the Bible and just continue to read it. And the Lord ministered so much grace to me in those night seasons. They become a deposit of grace gold into my life. A very real relationship was developing with Jesus Christ in the midst of the trial of life that I, had, I was completely missing. Dearly beloved, this is what it means to be a living sacrifice transformed by the renewing of our minds instead of being conformed into an image, into a structure, a tradition that men may have come up with of what holiness looks like. It's you take your heart and your mind and you give it to God and you say, Lord, teach me how to worship and serve you where it becomes an acceptable, pleasing sacrifice to you, not to me. And when God wants to change it up like he did Abraham, right in the middle of your dedicated devotion, right in the middle of your zeal and your passion. Can you imagine the emotions that Abraham must have been feeling as he grabbed that knife and was ready? I'm going to do this, Lord. God stops him. No, 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 no. You're not going to do this. The plan is different. And that faith, that act of obedience, God honored. And this is the relationship that came out of it. In James, in James chapter 2, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works, or we can say by his obedience, when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, your faith is perfected. The continual perfection of your faith changes. When you, when you begin to cook something or bake something, it's not instant. Now, even the microwaves aren't instant, right? You put it in the oven and it, it begins to change. The, 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 the whole thing begins to change, whether it's bread or, or a cake that you're, that you're baking or whatever you have in the oven, it, the heat begins to change sometimes even the texture of the whole thing. That's what faith does to us. Faith being perfected in the test. You see that faith was working with his works. As a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God and he was reckoned to him as righteousness and look at the relationship. And he was called the friend of God. He entered into a new relationship with God. Where God became his best friend. God looked at that and he said, Abraham, 
Now I know that you fear me, that you and I have this close relationship, that you will not only do anything I tell you to do, but your faith is in my purpose for your life. You've grabbed a hold of that. You're grasping the whole purpose of this is your and I relationship. It wasn't about Isaac living or dying. Yes, it was. That was included. But what God was really after was a relationship with Abraham. Like he didn't have with any other man. Nowhere up to this point in the hundreds and thousands of men and women who lived was anyone called the friend of God. Only here in this test where his worship was tested and experienced with God. God said, you're my friend. God still says that. He said that to me back then. And he continues. When God says in your heart, you're my friend, your worship is not in vain. And you know it. There's nothing empty about it. But you see the Jews, their worship, it was empty because God hadn't, wasn't in it saying, you're my friend. You're doing this as an act of obedience to me. You're serving me. No, they were serving traditions. In Mark, going back to Mark chapter 7, this is expressed. So we see that worship is an issue of the heart. Oh, that marker isn't working either. See if I can find one over here that works. There we go. Worship must come from your heart. And the heart in the Bible is exchanged with different words. In Ephesians chapter 3, it calls it your inner man. In other places where Jesus said in John 4 that God is seeking those who worship in spirit, it's the word heart. In Proverbs, he says, Proverbs chapter 3, watch your heart, guard your heart diligently, for out of it come the issues of life, means your inner man. So worship must be from the heart. If it's not, it is vain because it becomes heartless. Now we know that word, right? Heartless. When someone is heartless, how, what other words would you use to describe a person like that? Any other words that come to your mind? A person who's heartless. Okay. Yep. Self-protected, maybe. Hmm? Dead. Stiff. Uncaring, right? When you sense someone is heartless, it means they don't care about you. Selfish. So many other words that you could put into that. And that's exactly what comes out of our worship. Our worship towards God becomes heartless. What happens, instead of your heart being focused on God and pleasing Him with your life, with your body, it becomes self-centered. Your heart is self-centered instead of Him-centered. And that's what God wanted to test in Abraham because Abraham was probably feeling a bit self-centered can you imagine how raw he was feeling? He had just given up Ishmael. Put, that was really hard for him. It really distressed him. And now God said, Isaac. And he had to give it, all this stuff away that was supposed to be the, his promise. It meant a lot to him. To him. To his posterity. And God said, but your posterity won't come from you, Abraham. It'll come from your faith. And that's exactly what happened. Do the Jews today, blood Jews, descendants of Abraham, are they the inheritance, the, those who inherit eternal life? Are they the ones who are going to be running the new kingdom of the new earth? No. Look what happened. And Abraham believed this. In Romans chapter 3, he tells us, verse 27. And will not he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you 
who though having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. It wasn't going to come through Isaac. Now, it did, the lineage of Jesus, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. Abraham, in Hebrews 11, says he believed it, and that's why he was okay with being a stranger in the land of promise, and he never owned a piece of land in all his life. He left his inheritance, the land he owned, which would have been given to him by his father, came to a land. And even though he became wealthy with animals and material things, he never owned a piece of land except his burial site. That's what Acts chapter 7, Stephen said. Abraham was a sojourner and he never owned a piece of land because his heart wasn't here. Because Hebrews 11 says this. And these all died. Actually, um, verse 9. By faith, Abraham lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Wasn't looking for the land of Canaan as his promise. He was looking for another country. Verse 15. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they had went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. He's prepared for them a city. That's what Abraham was living for. This comes out though. This heart of worship in Mark chapter 7 is expressed from the mouth and that's where praise comes in praise is a part of worship praise that is expressed from our mouth Hebrews chapter 13 tells us this Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15 through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise does it say once a day, two hours a day? What does it say? Continually. Offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. I've also noticed, and I've experienced this, that man has also come up with a tradition of what worship looks like in your body. What your body sacrifice of worship looks like. Things you do and things you don't do. And it is more filled, the tradition of man is more filled with the things you don't do with your body to make your body a living sacrifice than the things you do. But Jesus' teaching is different. It centers on the things you do with your body more than it, the things you don't do. Look at, for instance, one of the things in verse 14 of John, of Mark chapter 7, you'll notice this. Jesus said, and after he called the multitude to him again, he began to say, listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside the man which going into him can defile him, meaning the things he eats. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. 